This episode of the Media Leader Podcast was edited by our production partner, Trisonic, a results-focused agency that plans and buys all audio media. Check them out at trisonic.co.uk. That's trisonic.co.uk. That separation between creative and media, I don't think can hold in gaming for much longer, uh, because especially if you're trying to do the more ambitious stuff. Why aren't brands spending more in gaming? That has been the question that has, frankly, puzzled me and many others in this industry for quite some time. It is a challenging new space, to be sure, but given the vast audience numbers, it's surprising to have still yet to see a mass movement into the space. Where are the roadblocks? Are they platform and publisher side, agency side, brand side? At our Future of Gaming conference last year, one of the key takeaways was that of the need for brands and agencies to still get better educated on their options in the gaming space. And at the Future of Audio and Entertainment, which is occurring in London the day this podcast is released, we'll check in again on the state of gaming. I'll be hosting a panel, one of many discussions, about what is and isn't working well in in in-game advertising, be it intrinsic ads or more immersive experiences. Ahead of that event, I wanted to chat with one of my panelists to learn more about what the holdup is for brands in exploring a medium that is teeming with possibility. Reese Hancock is a technology, media, and entertainment consultant. Before striking out on his own, he worked at Epic Games' Innovation Lab, and prior to that, co-founded and led Metaverse studio and agency Metavision. Before getting into gaming, he also had a stint in Startup Radio. I wanted to get Reese's perspective on whether agencies were well-suited to planning and buying gaming inventory, and if not, how they should adapt. This is that conversation. I hope you enjoy, and be on the lookout at The Media Leader for write-ups, videos, and even further podcast episodes on takeaways from both the future of audio and entertainment and the future of brands events, which we're hosting this week. Enjoy. Reese, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Hello. Yeah, thanks for having me. I wanted to get started by getting to know you a bit better. Sure, um, sure. I'm curious, how did you get your start in media and what made you eventually settle on on gaming as one of the major mediums that you wanted to work with and, and explore as opposed to any other type of media? Gosh, me, well, media in general, I actually, I've kind of always worked in media. So I did student radio in university and then cool. I sort of fell into running a music media startup up in Manchester that was kind of quite ahead of its time. We did like branded content uh, with, with brands and events and podcasts. And then we would work with sort of artists, DJs, bands to create radio shows and content. Um, yeah, it was it was quite ahead of its time. Uh, we were slightly underfunded and it was very Manchester focused. So every time a brand would come through, they'd be like, yeah, but you're not London. So mm. it, it didn't it didn't last forever. And then the, the people who, who own that also uh, ran a podcast company, uh, podcast hosting. So I used to do a little bit around content partnerships and technology partnerships there. Uh, and then I kind of felt I didn't want to work in podcasting um, or audio. So I went to the London School of Economics to do a master's. Uh, where I was doing lots of things like media and tech policy and platform economics, and it was super interesting. And I did some research there around the future of traditional entertainment in the UK, particularly around the BBC, ITV, Channel 4, and young people and how young people view them versus YouTube, TikTok, um, Instagram, et cetera. And um, off the back of that, it was it was, it was was quite telling. It was, it was it, This would have been 2020, and... There were, insights coming out like young people want to be on the platforms they are and which today is very like everyone says that you need to reach audiences where they are but certainly I, I, I'm less sure about advertising but certainly in the TV space there was there was no appetite to deploy content mm. off platform as the BBC would call it sort of away from BBC iPlayer or away from a channel um, and some of the insights from that um, then yeah I was sort of, sort of thinking what could I do with this sort of research that I'd sort of done and then alongside it was COVID and I sort of got into gaming uh, because I was bored. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, I've always been a bit of a gamer, but not not massively, kind of a casual gamer. Mm-hmm. And sort of with COVID, I sort of got back into gaming. Um, and as a kind of nerd, I was a bit a nerd of the business of entertainment, sort of if you knew where to look, to sort of this idea of the metaverse was emerging. And then ITV were putting out for, uh, I was actually sort of applying to be a venture capitalist and sort of talking about UGC gaming and metaverse. And then, um, and a friend of mine, uh, who, who was my co-founder at Metavision, we used to come up with TV show formats together and we never really got anything made, but we got a couple of things in, in development. Mm-hmm. And then, um, uh, then ITV were looking to fund businesses that were targeting young people. And so we kind of, um, sort of tied these things together. We saw, I mean, if you look where audiences were going, like Fortnite and Roblox and Minecraft had these huge audiences and no one was really talking about them at the time. This is sort of back in the summer of 2020. 
so like well over a year before Facebook turned into Meta. Mm. So it was very good. It was like if if you're if sort of the strategic philosophy was reach audiences where they are and in places where you can make content. Well, Fortnite, Roblox, Minecraft was the obvious sort of post TikTok step for that. Uh, so yeah, we put we pitched um, what became MetaVision to ITV, and ITV funded it as a corporate venture. And then did that for a couple of years uh, before getting poached by Epic Games uh, to work on Fortnite and their sort of shift to being an ecosystem. Mm. And then now uh, work for, sort of work for myself doing consulting around kind of future entertainment, UGC gaming, about to start some stuff on AI. Um, so yeah, um, and then sort of advertising. I didn't sort of come into the space wanting to do advertising per se. Um, like our pitch to ITV was always around like entertainment IP and it being born out of UGC gaming, but they were like, we don't quite understand what you're saying. Why don't you be an advertising agency first? Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I kind of fell into working with agencies and then at Epic. Uh, yeah, so worked with media agencies, creative agencies at MetaVision uh, from around the world. And then at Epic, one of the things I was working on was like, what what does... Um, what what are third party brands and IP? What do we want them to do in Fortnite? And I was part of the team working on their strategic partnership with WPP. So I've kind of fallen into working with agencies and brands and whatnot. And also, I think where entertainment is going, brands have a big role in kind of funding the future entertainment sort of um, mm. in the sort of yeah branded entertainment kind of post linear stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it sounds like a, a whirlwind of, a, of just a few years, really. Yeah, um, because yeah. the pandemic really wasn't that long ago. <laughs> no, and, it's uh, been pretty wild, to be honest. Yeah, and and got, were you big in what? Like Animal Crossing was really big then, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I actually don't have a Switch, which is maybe sort of blasphemy ah, in right. the gaming. Uh, I tried to get one in COVID, but they were impossible to get your hands on. So that is I, true. I've not actually played it. But. So the, the, this whole console generation has been affected by COVID supply chain issues. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're uh, still not really seeing... I think lots of true next gen games aren't really out yet because they've all been delayed from COVID. Yeah, um, but you, I mean, you mentioned there's already a, a bunch of terms that you mentioned: you know, UGC gaming, the user generated content. content yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I find uh, gaming to be one of those things is um, similar to, I suppose, some other mediums like TV. It's like there's a lot of jargon I I inherent, and maybe if you are a gamer or have played games, the, the it comes really naturally. But I know there's lots of people in the industry that uh, maybe never grew up with games. Or oh god, yeah. They just don't know exactly how to tackle those mediums, and and I wonder if that has had something to do with uh, the the amount of money that has been poured into gaming seems to be, at least to me, less than the amount of audience that audience reach that people from, can from like an advertising perspective. from an advertising perspective. So I mean, I mean, gaming's so huge. I mean, my the bit I sort of know about is this sort of user generated yeah. bit. But it, you can break it down. I mean, people don't realize it, but the, the biggest type of gamer is the kind of Candy Crush mum mm -hmm. um, or the mobile gamer. And obviously people think about console gaming. Um, actually, a mate of mine, Jamie Lyons, who's head of gaming at PhD, he always he always describes gaming, separating out gaming as a medium with gaming with a capital G. Mm -hmm. So like this idea of like the gamer, esports, like RGB lights. <laughs> actually, when you look at the numbers of who a gamer is, it's, it's a lot more like a normal person than a lot of people think. And I think that's why a lot of brands maybe don't look into it as much because they, they sort of see sort of a sweaty kid in their bedroom where actually gamers in, in different areas are very, are just like your average person. Mm -hmm. And and within game environments, because there's lots of ways to do advertising too, yeah. especially if it's just an average person, there's lots of yeah, different yeah. ways to reach people that also play video games. But I know that in-game advertising, there's main, two main terms to know and that, that we're uh, going to be talking about um, at the Future of Audio and Entertainment, and that is intrinsic and immersive advertising. Yeah, yeah. Can you just go through quickly the definitions for what those mean? So, so I mean, I'm not an expert on intrinsic, but intrinsic to my understanding is sort of ba banner advertising with it or like sort of virtual out of home is probably the way I would call it but I don't think that is the technical term mm. um, there's really cool companies like uh, Anzu Bidstack who I, I guess you're putting billboards in games and Roblox have just um, just sort of I think they're in beta for their version of uh, sort of billboard advertising within games uh, and then immersive is more sort of exper what I would call sort of experiential um and so that could look like a branded world, uh, a, a branded game, or uh, branded integrations as well. So I mean, there's there's lots of examples, mm. but that, that's more I think that's more the sexier end of creating a fully branded experience or partnering with an existing game to sort of 
further the experience with with branded content. Mm. Uh, it definitely can be more sexy. Yeah. The question is uh, how much of how much input does that require? Because I would imagine it requires more thought. You have to make sure, from a development perspective, that everything's working as well. Um, have there been uh, immersive experiences that you've seen that you think have done particularly well? Yeah, that's a that's a big question. Um, so I mean, I'm as I say, I've never really worked on the kind of pure billboarding side of things, so the intrinsic, and yeah. I assume that's more like a traditional sort of PPC slash out of home media buy. Um, in terms of immersive, it really is how long is a piece of string because it's you can you can do sort of integrations, which I think, and we can kind of maybe come onto that as like a good first step for for brands and agencies. And then in terms of like branded worlds, I mean, the technology has changed quite a lot, so it. I mean, Roblox has always been more of a sort of games engine. Um, but Fortnite went from kind of like Lego in Fortnite Creative 1.0. And so it was it was very sort of idiosyncratic, but it was more like traditional, like layering pre-existing prefabricated props, whereas now it's more mm. like the Unreal Engine. So, and takes a lot more of dev team. So it really is, it depends what you want to do, basically. Um, and I think a lot of people are quite ambitious in the space, but it does to, to really go all out on the, the full experience um, if you want to maximize visual fidelity as well as gameplay like it can be uh resource resource heavy on 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 a lot of fronts mm. and so have there been ones that you thought have have done particularly well or are there are people still working out the best way? so so i think in terms of integration is a lot easier because it's like it's a bit like a tradition more traditional media owner so there's the mm. games or sort of experiences that live within these platforms where brands can come in and integrate their brand in a sort of more like <laughs> A branded partnership on on an ITV or a traditional media owner. I think that is where there's more success right now. Um, actually, MetaVision, uh, my old company, like the, the team there, they're still doing really good work. They just did one with WWF Earth Hour, which Earth Hour is like this thing where you turn the lights off once a year to, to signify their sort of campaign around energy usage and the planet. Um, and they partnered with various games in Fortnite to to sort of turn the lights off and that, that did some crazy numbers because they, a lot of these games already have pre-existing audiences uh, and I think actually Specsavers did one uh, on Roblox recently with Dubbit um, which I've not played but it, I think it's done pretty well as well because a lot of these games do have pretty sizable ongoing audiences mm. and I think there's it's a good way even if you're not a native brand I think it's a good way to sort of dip your toe in be seen to support creators because a lot of these experiences are created by creators and not just faceless games and sort of dip your toe in and start to sort of culturally embed your brand in these spaces if you've never been in gaming before uh in terms of the kind of full-on experience i think i mean there's been some good stuff over the years like we i i'd like to think we did some good work back in metavision like particularly i was very proud of our work with timberland but i think it's a lot harder these days because what is good is still being worked out uh, I don't think there's a real blueprint for what's really going to be a, br- a fully branded experience going forward. I think a lot of people are trying to work that out. I think some of the best so far, so the, the bigger projects, so Nike did uh, have done two Air Fours. Uh, so last year's one, which I think was probably the gold standard in in branded content in the space, was was partly helped with Ep- with Epic. But what they would do, they created this world that was fully bespoke, and it, they they used the Fortnite skin as a character so they created lots of cinematics and i think it started to point to the kind of wider storytelling that it, it's sort of using say the unreal engine you can create a game but you can use the same assets to start creating like advertising content uh, animations virtual production and i think it started to speak to where things things are going um and then i think some of the better stuff tends to be kind of small scale so uh, godzilla versus kong Mm. Uh, I don't know if you've seen that. Uh, uh, no, I haven't. I haven't yet. Did you like it? Uh, it's pure trash, but it's quite fun. <laughs> um, um, they did a they did like a playable trailer, and I think for the fully branded experiences, sort of cool brands slash IP works better at the moment. Or if not so cool brands are coming in, they need. To, I think they need to really focus on what the player wants rather than. I think there is some arrogance with some sort of brands who think they can drop a lot of money and expect lots of players to come to them. Um, and I, I don't think the platforms are kind of set up for that at the mm. moment. So I think you really have to sort of focus on the player rather than... I think anyone going into those full-scale productions needs to sort of accept that just by being there doesn't doesn't mean you're going to be an unmitigated success. Mm. Mm. Uh, it's an interesting point because it does make sense that you have a like a big IP brand wanting to promote yeah. a movie, let's say. That yeah. makes a lot of sense where there'd be a lot of interest in crossover. I mean, gosh, even... This is like early Fortnite, well, relatively early Fortnite. But I remember when they added like the John Wick skin, and yeah, that was yeah. like 
I mean, that to me was the first standout thing where I noticed other IP creeping into that space, and now it's like practically I, everyone's in there. But if I you're like, a, a, sorry, an important yeah. distinction though to make to anyone listening is that a skin, particularly in Fortnite, is is a separate thing. That's like a licensee deal that you would right. do with them, whereas a branded world is something you can do yourself without any involvement with Epic or Roblox in, in Roblox's case. Right. Um, and I think that is a key distinction because I think I've had so many conversations with agencies where in the whole time we've been doing this, even before I was at Epic, where it's like, oh, can we get skin? And it's like, well, nothing. that's nothing to do with us. And, you mm. it. and they, they've got a high buff, buff for that because they work with so much cool IP. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. So it, I think brands and agencies need to be thinking about the sort of branded experience, whether that's integration or full experience or, or intrinsic. That should be their focus because that's where they have control. I want to ask about that in more detail. But I think the point that I, I wanted just to add on to, to your prior point as yeah. well is that if you are a like a toilet paper brand or, yeah, or a yeah. brand that isn't necessarily obvious how they could integrate into the gaming experience, I could imagine that being extremely difficult to say, okay, let's try and design a game where our brand is involved, but it, it, like, it only makes yeah. sense for some brands or, or can all brands maybe work something out? I think I, this is a really interesting question and one I, I was doing quite a lot of thought on. I think there's a world... I, well, I think where branded entertainment or entertainment's going in general is it, it, brands are becoming media owners or will need to build their own kind of entertainment brands, not just for gaming, but for in general. I, I do think that I don't know if you're a F- random FMCG brand or your toilet paper, you will at some point probably need to. It might not be completely branded to your brand, but you might you you might have to invest in like a fun gaming experience or like some new gaming led brand that exists in some of these platforms that focuses on fun content is adjacent to your your brand, but you can build a player base. Um, I think we're still early for that, but I do I do think UGC gaming in particular will fall in the where I think sort of general branded content is going, which is brands becoming media owners and conversely media owners becoming commercial brands in some ways. Mm-hmm. I think I think UGC Gaming is a really good place for that to happen going forwards. Mm. I did want to circle back now to uh, your comment in terms of just working with agencies. Now, I'm curious, in your experience or in your mind, are agencies well attuned to be able to execute on campaigns within gaming, especially as it comes to immersive gaming experience as opposed to perhaps those, that intrinsic thing, which is buying, you know, Essentially, yeah. billboard space. So I'd imagine. I mean, I say I'm not. I'm not an intrinsic guy. So, but I'd imagine that's fairly. That's that's fairly in line with traditional media buys. Um, again, I would say branded integrations. I think me, that's like a more traditional um, media partnership, like a, working with an ITV uh, partnerships or I don't know Lab Bible, whatever. I think for the the full whack, there are some limits at the moment, and. It, those kind of full experiences are expensive. They're also, I think those kind of full experiences sit in this intersection where it requires a high level of creativity and creative understanding, not only of the brand, but then of the gaming sort of sphere or of the platform you're trying to, because each platform has its own cultural trends as well and gameplay trends. And so how you merge those two requires a lot of creative firepower. And then also in terms of production, like, this is not linear production where the creator passes it on to the production company that passes it on to the media agency to distribute. Gaming production is always on mm. and I think requires a more close relationship between the creative the creative and the um, production company. And then in terms of media, like you're not only like the distribution in UGC gaming is on platforms. And some of them, like Roblox has its own like paid media, Fortnite doesn't. And then it's like, what's the what's the kind of what we would call in the old MetaVision days, like the content ecosystem around your world that is going to help play it, people know about it, sort of take content out from it, yeah, bring, bring players in. And so I think it's a between all three pillars, there's a lot more and always on culture that's needed around gaming. And I think individually, I mean, I've worked with some of the best creative agencies in in London, uh, in London and media agencies, and like uh, the creative agencies are often. Like really wanting to learn more, and there was one particular project which we actually fully integrated with the creative agency, mm. and and it was probably my favorite project to work on. Even though what we ended up doing didn't come to light for some of the reasons I'll probably go and talk to <laughs> in in a moment. Um, but then they wouldn't have the budgets because they were with the media agency, and the media agency has the kind of more innovative budgets, but then maybe doesn't have the creative firepower, and it is often tied to particular year long campaigns. And so they they often aren't thinking for the long term, 
And then I think one of the big problems that I found uh, is sort of global versus regional. So we, I can think of multiple, multiple examples, both, well, mainly at the time MetaVision, where working with a brand, the budget's good, doing something interesting, and then the agency has remit for ex- like EMEA or UK and Ireland, right. or whatever it is. And then same brand does something in the US. And But because these platforms are global, and I, I'm, I'm less of an expert on the kind of dynamics of Roblox at the moment, but in Fortnite, there's no real regional targeting or anything like that. So like mm. when, when a brand speaks on these platforms, it's really speaking at a global level. And so the fact that these agencies are playing both on both sides, creative and media, are sort of playing in their area, they often don't actually know what, what the brand is doing on a global level. And yeah, so this one example of we worked with this creative agency. It was an awesome experience. We were trying to sort of re, essentially rebrand a very, very large FMCG brand from the ground up in a UGC gaming space first, and then use that to radiate across like TV, animation, all these other things. It was a really, really cool project. And then the the media agency was frosty because the media agency was from a different holding group. Mm. And then also they both only had a sort of certain regional remit. And then we went up to the sort of global levels of the brand there were issues there and they weren't they they didn't necessarily have the kind of power to do these things at a global level because you when you're trying to reposition a brand in such a way it kind of needs to be agreed at the global level so i think i think a lot of yeah that that kind of regional aspect i mean some brands will obviously regional and then it doesn't matter but i think some of the big brands that really pay some of these agencies bills um, I think gaming is going to be increasingly difficult unless they kind of figure that out. I think it's going to be increasingly difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, you've named a sort of a number of issues that are perhaps holding back the, the agency model from really doing this at a, at a high level that, that yeah. might be necessary for some of these big global campaigns and you're spending lots of money involved. You want to make sure it's, it's really quality. Yeah, I, I'm curious if you could sort of wave a magic wand and, and create some changes. What would you like to see from your perspective that you think would allow agencies to better handle gaming remits? That's a, that's a really good question. It's it's not easy because, I, I mean, I'm, I've never worked sort of network agency side. Mm. But from looking from the other side in, I think that separation between creative and media, I don't think can hold in gaming for much longer. Uh, because Especially if you're trying to do the more ambitious stuff. I think it can hold if you're just doing intrinsic or maybe some of these branded integrations. But if you're really going to use gaming as a brand building sort of channel Mm -hmm. i think i think you you start you need you'll need to get clients sort of aligned across both and maybe that's just better integration with the 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 media agency that's alongside it i think in all honesty i think let's say i i foresee this trend towards this kind of idea of 360 entertainment branded and brands being a part of that in some way and i do and i think the same sort of characteristics will apply, which is like this sort of this coming together of creative production and distribution because distribution is increasingly platformized. Production is going to be more efficient, things like AI and real time and, and, and whatnot. And so I think, and creative potentially could be empowered by these things. And so I think I'd like to see agencies sort of putting together global propositions that, that speak to that, that maybe have sort of a skill upskilled creative team that have a sort of virtual production studio and that have kind of media people ready to distribute this content at at a global scale i don't that might be happening i'm not sure i don't i've not seen anything i'm I'm pretty sure i would have seen something but i I think these big agencies if they're serious about sort of gaming and future entertainment at a global scale need to be putting that in place Mm -hmm. but i do think in the short term what people could be doing is replicating that model that we had at metavision with unnamed creative agency like the uk is so blessed for I think, I mean, the creators who make these things are all over the place. But in terms of agencies, I think the UK has the best ecosystem in the world. So like Metavision, which I I co-founded and still exists and is doing some great work. Carter, which is awesome. Eric and Tony there, they're doing some awesome stuff, particularly in Roblox and music, but they've also just launched a Fortnite studio in the last year. Dubit, which is, again, more of a production house there in Leeds. They do loads of stuff. Uh, Geek, if you're, again, more agency side. I'm trying a doppelganger, which um, they're the creative agency arm of the gang, which is one of the, again one of the big production companies. Like they, they're all based in the UK. Like if I was an agency with a big brand wanting to do this, I would find the right team that fits your needs, integrate them, and kind of learn from them because I can guarantee you these these teams won't know as much about your brand as you do. Mm-hmm. But they they sure as hell know 
what they're doing in these spaces. And I think really in- integrate with those teams, learn from them. And if I was a network, probably buy some of them. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I think we're, we're pretty blessed in the UK for, for these for these companies. So I like, lean on them, learn from them in, in more than just the usual brief and outsource way, like integrate them, integrate with them and learn from them. Definitely a, a space to watch, I see, uh, yeah. to, to see to the degree that that integration can happen over the next yeah, few years. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a number of other questions I wanted to ask you about gaming because gaming is tends to be rather cutting edge uh, when it comes to cultural moments, when it comes yeah. to technological development, especially young people um, love some of these types of games. Um, I find that if you can gamify experiences, you can often normalize them. I'm just thinking about even like Apple's App Store. Like without yeah. games, I don't know what the App, the App Store w- would look like today. So I'm curious, I had a... a few quick questions that I wanted to throw okay. you away that are, that are a bit more speculative. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Um, looking further into the future. So we've mentioned, you mentioned Meta Vision, you mentioned Meta earlier, Metaverse. I should also, I should note before we get any further, Metaverse wise, you have the Metaverse as defined as sort of the Fortnite Roblox, these user generated yeah, yeah. content experiences. Yeah. And then you also have the VR type of quote unquote yeah. Metaverse, which is um, still in development let's say i'm curious if you think vr gaming will become significantly more mainstream in the next five years so there's a couple of things there metaverse the, the word's kind of gone away um probably for probably a good thing now i think it's i think there was a lot of confusion so yeah the way i always saw it was it's it's about 3d experiential entertainment social entertainment experiences you're in a 3d environment and you're with your friends and you're doing cool stuff it's 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 the type of experience i call it the end Mm. Whereas VR, Web3, all of that is a means. And mm. I think that's where the confusion happens. Uh, in terms of VR itself, I mean, I've never been particularly bullish on VR. Um, I, it's, I mean, it's cool, don't get me wrong. But I think even the most, like, the, the, the biggest estimate of VR is that it will be as big as the game console, which is obviously quite big. But it's not, like, iPhone level of ubiquity mm. or, like, smartphone level of ubiquity. So I think... Um, and and I think it's just it's just an entry point to these these sort of virtual three D experiences, and so like Roblox is now on VR, so you can be in Roblox and have a headset on, but then you can also be on your iPhone and be be, be in Roblox. So I just I just think it's an entry point. I think I, I mean I think there are cool VR experiences, but I don't think VR gaming is going to set the world alight. Mm. You mentioned just now uh, sort of this idea of cross platform gaming that you could be playing the same game. On your phone versus someone in the VR space versus someone on a console, let's yeah. say. Um, I've noticed a lot more of this uh, over the past few years. Do you expect games to be increasingly cross-platform? Not in the sense of it releases on multiple platforms, but that you can keep playing with people that if you're on a yeah. PlayStation that you can play with someone on Xbox. Do you expect more games to continue to do that? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think in terms of console gaming, that's like Xbox kind of broke down the barrier on that. I know Sony would against it for a long time. I, but I think in terms of if, I think Fortnite and Roblox probably want to be the platforms for the th- for the 3D internet. And so to do that, you need to be, you need to access them on console, mobile, or mobile is kind of key, which is why obviously Epic do that stuff with Apple. Mm. So yeah, absolutely. Otherwise, otherwise you're not going to reach a sort of potential infinite audience. And I think things like cloud gaming, potentially, uh, but it, it's yeah. still cloud gaming at the, where it's at the moment is still sort of, uh, is limited by the fact it has to stream video. I think when you get, I think I think it's called edge streaming, where you sort of stream the data and then render it locally. That's where cloud gaming, I think, will, will potentially take off. Mm. Uh, what do you make of someone like Netflix increasingly entering into gaming? Um, I mean, it may, I mean, if you're sometimes a cynic about entertainment like I am, you, like you, you're comparing all these things together, like a reading the media leader versus listening to a podcast on Spotify, listening to um, spot, uh, yeah, listening to music, watching TV. Mm. Then it kind of makes sense because gaming is a big is a big sort of area of time spent. So and they are essentially a subscription software for your time spent. Um, and so gaming makes sense. I think be interested to see what they do. I've seen some. They did a couple of things in. I think actually Metavision did that stuff with. Uh, One Piece, and I know I, I was had nothing to do with it, but I know they chat to Epic all the time about stuff. So I would not be surprised if we see more from from them in the coming years. 
what do you make of the idea of sort of shoppable gaming? We see a lot of shoppable TV now, um, which is coming in where yeah. people can purchase items. That I mean, are- I'm actually skeptical if anyone. No, no disrespect to my former TV colleagues, but I'm actually, I, I don't know if anyone uses that. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. I suppose we'll see. It's, it's one of those things where that it's uh, an idea looking for the demand. I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think I'm more bullish on the kind of in-game purchases uh, for right. Like if if you have a branded world and you're selling a selling a skin in say Roblox, I, I'm pretty sure at some point they will they will set up some kind of e-commerce system. I don't know what that looks like, but I, it. it would seem strange not to, especially as they're looking to diversify revenues. The, the idea being that if you're buying, let's say, a, a branded skin in a game, you could yeah. you could also maybe buy that clothing item or whatever yeah, it is or, in real life. Exactly, or or even like a TikTok shop style. Mm. I don't think a Roblox would do the same thing as TikTok shop, but if a brand comes in and wants to sell you something, you can potentially link your account, and that wouldn't surprise me. I whether it takes off, I have no idea, but. Um, I, I, especially as like com- Roblox in particular, they need to diversify their revenues because well, that's why they've done the ad tech because they're not. I don't. I'm pretty sure they're not profitable yet, and they need thirty percent of their revenue goes to to Apple or any any app store creators. So it just makes sense that they would they would include that at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mentioned AI a little bit earlier. How could AI impact developers? And also advertisers in the gaming space. And that's a very broad question. Um, so, I mean, I know there's lots of startups that are starting to look at AI in the space, sort of generating assets. Gener- I mean, Roblox already has this sort of Gen AI, gen AI um, creator of content. So you can type, "Oh, I want a, I want a big tree" or whatever, and it comes up. Mm. Um, I just think it will. I think, and it's this is the same across lots of media. I just think it will make the the means of production more efficient, um, make it more attainable. Brands can maybe brands that maybe don't have the mega budgets of of a of a global brand or a IP sort of fan fan heavy brand can sort of test and learn a bit more in the space. I I mean, obviously, who knows where AI will go? But I, I'm positive. I'm hopeful that it will be a way to empower more creatives rather than reduce the pie if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But obviously we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah, lots of unsure uh, future there in terms of AI. One, one one more question here. What games are in development that you are most excited about from a consumer perspective as a fan yeah. and then also from a commercial perspective? Um, God, this is a good question. Um, I think from a, from a personal perspective, Hellblade 2, I don't know if you've played the first one. I've not. Uh, it's, a re- it's a really cool game uh, made by Ninja Theory, who are based in Cambridge. It was all about kind of a medieval game, all about psycho- psychosis, and it's kind of like a slasher, but and puzzle based game. But it's it's really cool. But the second one's coming out next month on Xbox, PC, and Game Pass, and it's probably the first true next gen game that uses the power of Unreal Engine Five. Meta, it looks it looks like a movie, and so really excited to play that. And I think we'll start to see the power of like what game engines can do in in entertainment. Mm. Um, so yeah, and I think it's tough because there was there was there was some discourse over the last couple of weeks about sixty percent of game time is now taken up by games that are that are sort of ongoing games like a Fortnite, Roblox, Call of Duty, Warzone. Right, and we haven't pit peak at any of those games potentially. But I, but so I guess what, commercially, I'm intrigued with how they evolve to stay relevant mm. and how they open up. So for example, I'm really intrigued about EA Sports FC, the new FIFA. Right, like at the moment, at the moment, it's very much like. The same old, same old, just taken the FIFA brand taken off. But like, what does it mean to be more of a football gaming platform going forward? So I'm really intrigued what that looks like. I think more broadly, I think in gaming, from my understanding on the more sort of traditional gaming side, like budgets have gone up and up and up, and it's kind of been too big to fail. A bit like movies and everything has been Marvel and IP. Games like film and maybe like other mediums as well have been too big to fail. It's actually sort of reducing the budgets right down and trying doing more creative bets and i think we're going to start doing that seeing that in film and i think we'll start seeing that in gaming as well we can't like even sony now is saying they can't they don't necessarily make money on one of their 250 million million dollar like spider-man games Mm. so like what does a 10 million vc backed game start look like from day one and expand out if they find an audience i think i'm more i'm quite intrigued to see where the creative bets and then also on, on ugc platforms fortnite roblox minecraft and and others will emerge like what is the IP that emerges from there? That's that's kind of what brought me to the space was like the future entertainment IP 
will be born out of a Roblox or a Fortnite, not out of linear TV. It's a bold, bold claim. Uh, I, I, I've said it for about four years and uh, people, are, I, you're starting to see it already in kids' TV, for sure. Right. But I think in general, it's, I think people are starting to accept that is going to be the case. Yeah. And it's interesting, your, your other point as well about sort of comparing to, to cinema, where you have these massive big budget games that are ne- not necessarily making enough money, even despite selling yeah. millions and millions of copies. And then you have these indie games that do particularly well or free to play games like Fortnite. Um, yeah, yeah. that uh, do extremely well because they can scale very quickly because yeah. they're free. But those mid-budget games are yeah. often the times where you get a lot of really interesting creative ideas, where you get um, a lot of critical acclaim. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's the same thing in the film industry as well, where the mid-budget has shrunk. Uh, yeah, yeah. As, and and as it also it comes under different models. So I, I'm a big advocate for Xbox Game Pass. Um, yeah. It's like £10 a month and you get all their latest games. Plus, you get a mixture of licensed games and new and new and old, and I think a lot of interesting creative bets are coming out of there. Yes, I've heard a lot of games referred to as like the best Game Pass game. Right? Yeah, like yeah. I mean, Lies I, of P was one I remember. A like it, it takes me a lot to spend 70, 70 pounds on a game now. It would, it would mm. have to be a game I really want because Game Pass has. So it stuff. changes the value exchange. Yeah, it, does. it does. Yeah, I I also have Xbox Game Pass, <laughs> and I specifically got an Xbox because I wanted access to Game Pass. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and for the longest time, I was a PlayStation guy. Was yeah, like, oh, well, that was a, yeah. that was a big seller. So Microsoft uh, certainly got me there. Nice. I'm yeah. sure they'll, they'll be happy to. Hear yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure they will. <laughs> anyway, um, one last question uh, yeah. I wanted to ask. We asked this question of, of all of our guests on the podcast. Um, it's a broad question. Why are you passionate about media? I, I, it's a good question. I think I, I've always been interested in it. I, I just, I think for me, my interest in, in culture is like where it really reaches like a sort of a mass. Like I love say a world cup of the year is where everyone's watching it. And I think it's just, it's just a space I've always been interested in. But I think what I find interesting now is that it's all up for grabs. Like the, the models that have underpinned entertainment of the last oh God, 50 years are kind of breaking down. And so, like, what does the future look like? That's kind of why I came into, not out of a love of gaming, but because I've, I've, I really genuinely believe that we're going to see a whole new world of, sort of entertainment IP, branded IP. Or I, I just think it's all to play for at the moment, and no one really knows what's going on. I have an opinion, but it's not played out yet. Um, and I think, I think sort of that point where people just irrationally loving something as well, I just find really fascinating. Let's, I mean... I like Star Wars as much as the next person, but like a true Star Wars fan, like what is it about Star Wars that people just are obsessed by? Or like sport, sport is the same. It's like people treat their football team like like a religion. And mm. it's, I just find that that level of interest in in things that ultimately don't matter really fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like the the truest Star Wars fan actually hates Star Wars more than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I maintain the last Jedi was quite good, but there we go. Well, I, we don't have to get into a whole debate about this. Uh, Reese, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for yeah, joining thanks me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Media Leader Podcast. This episode was edited by our production partners, Trisonic. You can find and listen to all our episodes on our website at themedialeader.co.uk or wherever you get your podcasts. But just remember, please do subscribe to be notified when we release our next episode. From all of us at The Media Leader, I'm editor Omar Oaks. Our executive producer is Jack Benjamin. See you next time.